speaker in this case is Elon Musk himself. The SpaceX CEO posted a video of himself playing the video game Diablo 4 on X, which just happened to include audio from a conference call about the Starship Flight 5 aftermath. And from that recording, we can glean three very important Starship details. The first being that the Super Heavy was just one second away from triggering a final abort as it closed in on the Mechazilla Tower. We hear an unknown SpaceX employee recounting the quote, scary shit that happened during the booster landing burn. Working in chronological order, the scariest incident seems to have occurred during the relight of Super Heavy's inner 13 Raptor engines. He says that there was a misconfigured spin gas support that didn't quite have the right ramp up time for bringing up spin pressure. What does that mean? SpaceX uses compressed gas to spin up the Raptor's turbo pumps prior to engine ignition because the turbo pump or the fuel pump is powered by a pre-burner. But the only way to get fuel into that pre-burner is to spin the pump. So it needs external force to get the whole process into motion. That comes from an onboard compressed gas canister, which we'll talk about in a bit, but the way I interpret what he's saying is that the pressure into the engine didn't ramp up as fast as expected by the flight computer, which very nearly triggered an explosive finale. The employee says, We were one second away from that tripping and telling the rocket to abort and try to crash into the ground next to the tower, to which Elon replies, Wow, yikes as he continues to slay enemies in his video game. The voice on the phone then explains that this scenario could, quote, erroneously tell a healthy rocket to not try the catch. If we remember back to this post by SpaceX on the morning of the launch, they write that thousands of distinct vehicle and pad criteria must be met prior to a return and catch attempt of the Super Heavy booster. The voice on the phone is essentially explaining that some of these criteria may have been a little too stringent. He says, quote, we had a whole bunch of new aborts and commit criteria that we tried to double check really well, but I mean, I think our concern was well placed and one of these came very close to biting us. There's a bit of crosstalk after about timelines basically saying that SpaceX could have chosen to delay the launch by another day to check more of the criteria with more detail, but it might not have even made any difference. If you imagine this big list of systems that needs to be made with a set of tolerances for each item, you're telling the computer that if the reading goes outside of this range, then abort the entire tower catch. How tight would you make those tolerances? Those are a lot of incredibly difficult decisions to be made. So by breaking down the flight data in the aftermath of a successful catch, the engineers could compare line by line what they anticipated would happen against what actually happened which is going to play a big role in what we see on Flight 6. More about that one in a bit. The next point that is brought up relates to the damage we saw on the exterior of the booster, the missing chine cover. Voice on the phone says that right at transonic, which is the point where the rocket is transitioning from supersonic speed to subsonic speed, just before engine startup, one of the chine covers rips off. We can see this ourselves looking at the super slow-mo video captured by Cosmic Perspective. Go check that out for yourself afterwards on the Everyday Astronaut channel, it's amazing. You can see a little piece of sheet metal flapping in the breeze as the booster free falls. Then once the engines ignite, the whole section of the chine gets torn to shreds. According to the voice on the phone, this was anticipated to happen, but it couldn't have occurred in a worse spot. He confirms that the skin on the chines is held down by spot welds, so it's not as strong as the continuous beads that hold the ring segments together. There has been some debate about how much force these small welds can actually withstand. Clearly not enough. And this particular damage occurred right above a bunch of single point failure valves that are crucial to the landing burn. So that compressed gas that's needed for the engine to relight is held in pressurized bottles that are inside those aerodynamic chines. All of the equipment that controls the pressure release was exposed to the elements during the landing burn. The call cuts off at a point when he's describing how the plume coming back up the rocket from the landing burn could have potentially caused a lot of damage to a really important system. The third takeaway here is that Flight 6 of Starship will be a lot like Flight 5. Elon said last week that Flight 6 is coming very soon, and the discussion on the phone seems to confirm that. Our voice on the phone says that SpaceX is trying to focus on booster risk reduction versus ship envelope expansion. 
so they'd rather focus on repeating the success of the booster catch than try to do something new with the ship, such as a higher altitude and a deorbit burn. Voice on the phone then says that there won't be too much time taken to study the data from Plight 5, just as much as they need. Considering that this next Starship launch will be the first time that it hasn't been constrained by the FAA, SpaceX can launch whenever they want, so they're trying to do a reasonable balance of speed and risk mitigation on the booster. Europe has a new plan that will take them to the surface of the moon and beyond in decades to come. The European Space Agency has released a new blueprint for the future titled Explore 2040. The name could be a little confusing, so to clarify, these are not things that ESA hopes to do in 2040, but the things that they plan to have accomplished by 2040. The key priority behind this new initiative is to increase the pace of development at ESA. We know the Europeans can accomplish great things in space exploration, but those accomplishments have also been very few and far between, so at least the people in charge are conscious that this is a problem. The most ambitious goals outlined involved sending Europeans into lunar orbit and then to the surface of the moon, with the long-term horizon for 2040 to be a European crewed mission to Mars. Explore 2040 will be a key point of discussion next year at the Council of ESA's member states. This only happens once every three years and will be crucial to shore up support for the key programs of Explore 2040. In the short term, there will be a focus on a low Earth orbit cargo program that will both send and return critical material to and from the ISS. The idea being that this will set the stage for the first European human spaceflight capabilities. If they can send objects to space and back first, then they can move on to people. As for the moon, ESA is already building the service module for NASA's Orion capsule that will transport crew for the Artemis program. So the Europeans already have a strong foothold in lunar exploration, but they'll be taking it one step further with the Argonaut lander. This is a joint effort with the Dutch manufacturing giant Airbus, and the new lander will be specifically designed for delivering cargo to the surface of the moon with a capacity of 1.7 metric tons. Moving on to the planet Mars, ESA has a plan called Lightship. This is an electronic propulsion tug that would be able to deliver passenger spacecraft and scientific payloads to Mars, in addition to establishing a communication and navigation network in Martian orbit. This would be in addition to the commitment ESA has already made for Mars exploration in the short term, primarily the Rosalind Franklin rover which will drill down 2 meters below the Martian surface in search of alien microbes, and the Earth Return Orbiter that ESA will provide to support NASA's Mars Sample Return mission. Meanwhile, the Chinese are already talking about the next expansion of their Tiangong station. The three-module T-shaped station was completed in November 2022. And in a recent talk at the International Astronautical Congress, the China Academy of Space Technology claimed that the station will soon double in size. The first step in the expansion will be to update the Tianhe core module with a second multi-docking adapter to accept new modules. They'll essentially build a second Tiangong on that end of the original core, creating a kind of double T-shape in the process. In addition, China is continuing work on their next crewed spacecraft, the Mengzhou. This will come in two variants, one designed for sending crew to Tiangong and the other designed for sending crew to the moon. The idea is that lunar trips will